Good morning and a Christian greeting to each of you. I first of all want to apologize for being late. After we were going down the road a couple miles, I all of a sudden happened to think about it. I forgot my hearing aids. So I guess what we lack on our head, we're going to make up in our feet. So that was what happened this morning. Turn with me to Romans 1. I had no idea that you'll be studying, we'll be studying Romans 1 in our Sunday school lesson. No idea. Nobody told me. But that's what I feel led to preach. And I'm not necessarily apologizing for that. But I think as we think about the, the whole concept of local outreach, I think we have some very important exhortations from Romans 1 that would give us direction. I want to focus particularly on verse 14 through 17. If we could stand to read those verses, verse 14 through 17. Those of you who would be in the can, would you stand? I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Thank you. You may be seated. I've entitled the message, I am a debtor. I am ready. And I am not ashamed. Now, Probably all of us relate to having a debt, a monetary debt. We probably all relate to that. Either you are currently yet in debt, or you have been in debt. As far as money is concerned. Most of us who are in debt, we're indebted to some kind of a financial institution or we're indebted to someone who stepped forward and loaned us some money. And for those of you who have fulfilled the obligations of whatever the monthly, was it a monthly payment, was it a, uh, whatever the agreement was. But when you made that final payment, you felt good about it. Sure did. I, for many years, or we had for many years, wanted to make a trip to the Holy Lands, but we felt as long as we're in debt, it shouldn't be an option for us for our consideration. So in the year 2000, we were debt free. Now we've gone into debt a, a number of times since, but we're out of debt at the present time. And so we made the trip in 01 and I'm uh, blessed with that but you know what when you made that final payment you felt a relief you didn't feel like a debtor anymore did you you maybe even went out and celebrated by having a special meal somewhere in other words well, it's complete now I have wonderful in a spiritual sense, do we kind of think a little bit the same, have the same type of thought processes that, oh, now I'm saved, I'm, I've got the joy of the Lord in my heart, and, and uh, yeah, I, uh, we kind of relax. Now, as I look at the scripture here where the Apostle Paul said, I am a debtor, 
I don't see that there's any evidence that it was a limited to a certain point of time. In other words, that after a certain time, my obligation as a debtor expired. I don't see that at all. Now, my question is, in the spiritual sense, do we feel an indebtedness? Why, what, what was it about the Apostle Paul and his mission and work that he felt he was a debtor? Reference was made to the fact that the Apostle Paul had never been at home. And uh, so why would Paul feel that I'm a debtor to these people when he had no connection? Maybe, maybe he knew some of the Roman Christians. I don't know. We don't really know. But there's a possibility that may have been the case. Now, I find it interesting what he says. He says, both to the Greeks to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. As I understand it, the Greeks were considered the educated ones, the civilized ones, if you please. You know, some of us, you know, maybe we feel a little bit intimidated, particularly if, if we're in the presence of someone who's quite educated. Maybe has a college degree. Um, their intellect far exceeds mine. And uh, we feel a little bit intimidated. I remember so well, shortly after I was ordained, I was ordained at Lot, Elmer Schmucker, and Andy Mullet were my co-pastors. The bottom line is, I had initially, I struggled because both of these brethren, they can really help themselves in the pulpit. They can express themselves well. Their intellect, as I see it, as far exceeds mine. But you know what? I finally came to the conclusion, God didn't ask me to be an elder. He didn't ask me to be an Andy. He asked me to be me. And when that issue was settled in my mind, things <laughs> seemed to kind of fall into place. But the Apostle Paul here says he is indebted to the, to the educated, to the civilized, the cultured world of the day. And then he also said to the barbarians, the impression I get about the barbarians is they were considered the uncivilized. And uh, they were, well, in my notes here, I have the, the word uncultured. Well, the bottom line is every last one of us have a culture. Um, in fact, I think it would be true to say that every church has a culture. I'm, I'm thinking that probably the culture here is slightly different than it is in Texas in our church. So culture is everywhere. Even those folks who have never heard the gospel, who live in very primitive situations, there's still a culture there. And the Apostle Paul is saying, I am a debtor to them. Let's look at a number of examples of the Apostle Paul's expressions. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19 through 23, he says this, for though I be free from all men, Yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I may win Jews. 
to those who are under the law as under the law that I may gain those that are under the law and to those who are without law as without law that I might win those who are without law to the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some now I do this for the gospel's sake that I may be a partaker of it with you that's that's a powerful powerful expression of being a debtor trying to become like the people he was around finding common ground I am trying to adapt to all of these people but I think it is one thing that I do gain from this is that whatever adaptation he made it never involved disobeying the word of the Lord never involved disobeying the word of the Lord or violating his allegiance to Christ he did it with one purpose in mind and that is to have the opportunity to preach the gospel to all types of people in order to win them to Christ what a powerful testimony because of he feeling his indebtedness I had to think of the scripture in Romans 12 1 where it says I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God I like to think this way that I believe that the Apostle Paul felt indebted to all people because of the mercy of God that he experienced. He was, he was a, actually a murderer, wasn't he? He participated in, in, in murder. And we, we think murder is a very gross sin to commit. And, and indeed it is. But God raised him up. God forgave him. You know, you look at the, uh, some of the Old Testament prophets. Their record wasn't squeaky clean either, was it? You look at David. Like David, he was a murderer, wasn't he? Yes, he was. But he found the mercy of God. And I'd like to think that that is foundational in the Apostle Paul's experience that he could say, I am a debtor to all people to let them know of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Mercy. Mercy, the mercy on God. Have you experienced mercy? Indeed you have. Now, I'll share this for what it's worth, but just to point out what it, uh, the blessing of mercy. While we lived up here in Michigan, we had borrowed money from the bank for there to purchase the vineyard. And uh, it was during the winter months when my work was very <coughs> slow that I didn't have the money to make the payments. And so I went into the banker ahead of time. And I took my coupon book along. I put that on the banker's desk and I said, sir, I am here to say that I am sorry. I do not have money to pay this this month. He looked at me and he said, "You're the first man to ever come into this bank." And before the payment was due, and tell me that you're not going to be able to make it. He said, "I'll tell you what we'll do." He took that coupon for that month, took it out. And he stapled it in the back and said, what was the end of the month? I experienced mercy. It was something that I never forgot. I experienced mercy. All of us have experienced mercy from God's own hand. We didn't deserve it. We didn't do anything to deserve it. But because of the mercy of God and his great love for us, 
He made it possible that you and I can be reconciled to him. And I think it was because of the fact of the Apostle Paul having experienced the mercy of God that he felt as a debtor to bring the good news of the message of salvation to everyone. A couple more examples of, of uh, this very thing of the Apostle Paul's expression. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 2, he says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And then in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, he talks about some of the the, the difficulties such as the bodily weaknesses he had and the discouragement that he faced, the dangers that he faced, the opposition of false brethren, and even the threat of death in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. But Paul, in spite of those difficulties, he kept on, he continued to preach the word with much zeal and intensity. So in other words, he felt to, it was, he was indebted regardless, was it considered as a convenient time or a good time? He felt compelled to, to as, a, as a debtor to all men, regardless of the difficulty of circumstances that he faced. And I believe it should be true for us today. We need to share the gospel when we're in school, when we're in the office, when we're in the workplace, when we're at the restaurant, when we're at the hospital, or when we're in commercial buildings, or any place that we go. People come, people go, people are everywhere. The question is, do each of us look at a person and think, is this person without the gospel of Christ? If he is or she is, do I have an obligation to share Jesus Christ? I mean, we owe sometimes, I believe that God brings those people across our path to the light, if you please. I believe that's that's that is the the uh, the way that God works. No matter how busy in life we are, we need to be thinking about the mercy of God on our lives. And what, like I say, when we think about the mercy of God, it makes a difference how I relate to others. In the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul says this, in chapter 20, verse 26 and 27, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. We see Paul's attitude here toward the preaching of the gospel. The gospel was of utmost importance to him as it concerned a person's spiritual life really it is a matter of life or death. He withheld nothing concerning the truth of God's word. He preached the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The truth regarding the gospel needs to be shared to all as it determines whether a person is saved or lost. No wonder that Paul said, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Paul never ceased to, to relax, as you were, thinking, well, I paid my debt. He never, he, you, you don't get that idea from scripture at all. I'm thinking of in the book of Romans as well, chapter 11 where he talks about the the uh, the fact that the Jewish Jews rejected Christ and the new branches were grafted in 
And he says, he makes it very, he, he, he says in verse 14 that his desire is that somehow that the people of Israel could be, would be jealous of what the Gentiles have so that I might save some. Now, we, we clearly understand from scriptures that the Apostle Paul was primarily commissioned to, to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That was his primary focus. But I think the heart of the Apostle Paul was he felt an indebtedness to his own people. He really did. He felt an indebtedness to his own people. 1 Corinthians 1 23 he says but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness in Acts 26 we read that he preached to kings the cult the, the learned of the day to the wise and to the unwise in chapter 14 of Acts he even preached to the household of Caesar when he was imprisoned in Rome Now, it is true, not all of us have, quote, an ordination to preach. But like I say, I would like to suggest this morning that all of us are called with an indebtedness to preach the gospel within the ability that God has given you. God wants us to, to um, make him known. He wants us to make him known. We are an indebtor all of our life in this respect. Again, a fire on the inside affects everything that we do on the outside. I think that is so true. You know, sometimes you hear these comments saying that, ah, this, this doesn't really matter that much what I look like on the outside. I would just like to say what I, what you see on the outside is what's on the inside. I really believe that's true. May the fire of God burn in our hearts that each of us are feel indebted to share the good news of the gospel, the mercy that we have received and experienced in our own hearts, that mercy can be shared with others. Now, the next one is I am ready. In Acts 5, verse 42, he says, And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Christ Jesus. Acts 9, verse 15, which was a verse that was read this morning by Brother Steve. The Lord said to him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And in chapter 20, verse 31, he says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And even here in this chapter, verse 13 through 15, it says, brother, he said, brothers and sisters, I had planned many times to come to you, but I was prevented from doing so. But I look forward to coming to you. I'm ready to preach. I feel indebted to preach. And when he had the opportunity, he preached. And in the, well, in verse 15, he says that uh, he's ready to preach to you who are at Rome. The New Living Translation uses the word eager. I am eager to preach the gospel. <coughs> Do we relate in that kind of way? I think it's first uh, scripture in Peter where he says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks of you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Brother, to be quick-witted 
and allow the Spirit of God to use him to give an answer on the spot. My, my hat is off to those brethren. We ought to pray for those brethren every day that God would use them in such a way that the gospel of Jesus Christ can go forth and that others may come to know him. I don't consider myself to be a quick-witted man. I, I feel like, you know, kind of my experience is I need a little bit of time to digest something. They go through, sometimes pray about it and sometimes sleep over it before I'm ready to give an answer. And, uh, but no matter what our makeup is, the injunction is that we should be ready to give some kind of an answer. You know, sometimes I have said to individuals when they ask me a question, I've said, well, would you give me a little bit of time to think this thing through and pray about this before I answer? And most people are very gracious about that. So no matter what your, your makeup is, God wants to use everyone and he can, he can use a vessel that appreciates the mercy of God. I am ready. Now, I don't know what your local outreach is here. I don't know if you uh, uh, you have uh, a routine of going to the nursing home and singing. I don't know if you have a routine of visiting someone in the community. Uh, I, I don't know. I didn't ask. But when those opportunities come, where are you <coughs> and sisters? Are you ready to go? Are you ready? Are you right there? Or is your thought, oh, I'll, I'll just wait a little bit, maybe there'll be enough volunteers without you. Are we ready? Apostle Paul said, I'm ready. I think he took every opportunity he had every opportunity. Now, the last one, I am not ashamed in verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and to also to the Greek. Someone has suggested that this verse is the central theme of the book of Romans. Now, I agree with Brother Melvin who said this morning in our Sunday school class, that the book of Romans has so much meat. There is so much that we understand about salvation because of the book of Romans. There's a lot of meat there. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And I think that that is an injunction that should be clearly embedded in every one of our minds that we are not ashamed. You know, as a young person, sometimes I was ashamed. You know, when we do something wrong, and our, I remember as a little boy when we did something wrong, and mom and dad found out about it, I was ashamed. That was the right time to be ashamed and to acknowledge my wrong. It was right to do so. But when we when it comes to the Christian life, we don't, don't have anything to be ashamed about, right? Because we are at peace with God, we've experienced the mercy of God, and as far as we know, we have, we have cleared any type of wrongs with anyone. We don't have anything to be ashamed about, do we? <coughs> Not at all. We don't have anything to be ashamed about. Now, Jesus said in Mark 8, verse 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. If we're ashamed here to speak of the mercy of God that we've experienced, it says here that the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he cometh and sin in his glory, the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Another verse in Romans 9, verse 33, the Apostle Paul says this, and is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling block, a rock of offense. 
And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Romans 10 verse 11 for the scripture saith whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed 2nd Timothy 1 8 be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me his prisoner but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God then in verse 12 of the same chapter he says for the which cause I also suffer these things nevertheless I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You know, talking about being ashamed. As an employee, if I'm not actively engaged in my work and my employer comes, what kind of a feeling do you have? You feel ashamed, don't you? You are ashamed that you got caught, so to speak, right? But when you do what is expected of you and your employer comes, you're free. And so it is in the Christian life. We who have experienced the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness of God, we are free. We don't have anything to be ashamed about. You know, sometimes, particularly young Christians, feel ashamed of identity, being identified with God's people. And um, God help us. God help us. We're not ashamed of identity. Shame. Second Timothy uh, two fifteen, the apostle Paul says, "Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth." Study the word study. I'm not quite sure what all is implied here, but I get the picture that there ought to be some diligence on my part to acquaint myself with God, be acquainted with God, have a connection with God in such a way that that uh, I can be an approved workman. And then I don't have to be ashamed. I have nothing to be ashamed about. Titus 2 verse 8 says, Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say to you. I remember so well one time uh, going to the lumber yard in Marlin, Texas. This was when we lived in the lot community. And uh, uh, Larry Brothers was kind of the main salesman there, just a small lumber yard. And one day I came in there and he was talking with a number of customers, I guess it was, and he, I walked in there, and Larry had his back to me, and he was, he was talking to these, these customers, and I had no idea that that kind of language comes out of Larry, because I never, never had heard him speak like that, and when he turned around and saw that I was standing there, he was very ashamed of his speech. He apologized to me. I didn't say a word. A godly man whose speech is above board, is sweet and pure and holy, is to be commended. You have don't I have anything to be ashamed about? I believe that should be characteristic of every child of God. Speech bears witness of having received mercy and grace and pardon and cleansing. Peter says it like this: 1 Peter 4, verse 16. If any man suffer as a Christian, 
let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So, uh, I am a debtor. I am ready. I am not ashamed. Are those things important to us, be it a local outreach, be it an outreach wherever we are? I believe that they are. This doesn't mean now that we're boastful and that we come across that I've got my act together. Not at all. In fact, God help us that we don't come across that way. I know my brother, he lives in Holmes County. And uh, he has talked about it to me that this church group, if they're an Anabaptist group, I'm not going to mention any kind of names. But he mentioned to me <coughs> that he feels it's just a bit difficult to have a good feeling about this group because they come across. We've got our act together. And that's not at all the sense that I get here from the Apostle Paul as being, being a debtor, being ready, and not being ashamed. I don't get the impression at all that he was arrogant, boastful, proud. I've got my act together. Not at all. I don't get that kind of impression from the Apostle Paul. I think it's important that we relate Caring, loving way. I believe it's so important we relate in that kind of way. Then God can use what is said to bring lift someone up. May God help us to keep be have this mindset that we are a debtor because of the mercy that we have experienced. And that we have acquainted ourselves with the, the good word of God in such a way that we are ready. And that's the kind of shame. Shall we do it? Our righteous eternal Father, we thank you for this time together. And I thank you for the testimony of God the Apostle Paul. I thank you for uh, his zeal and his desire that to help anyone who comes across this path. To help them come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I thank you for that testimony that we have. I thank you so much, Lord, for saving us. I thank you for the mercy of God and for your daily provision for us. I pray that we can truly be a light to the world and a salt in the earth, wherever we are. Thank you so much for the light of Jesus that, has, that shines, has shined and continues to shine into our hearts. We desire that light, that truth. Bless the word to each of our hearts this morning. Thank you for each one that is present here. And may we be what you want us to be. We ask in Jesus' name.